saved from the uh, urban centers will then be bottled in 5 kg and smaller uh, bottles and will be distributed in the rural areas because until unless you give them some alternate cleaner fuel um, uh, you know uh, you can't wean them away from from the biomass which is their own local uh, product so this natural gas induction got uh, suffered a setback because as you're aware the kg basin gas and other so the kind of gas which india was expecting uh, we will have uh, so this, these plans have got deferred, but still they are in place. And if you notice in the papers the other day that some gas of the industrial and the other components is being cut and cities are going to be given more natural gas. So that gas will then uh, uh, will substitute the LPG will get spared and LPG can be taken to the rural areas. And lastly, you mentioned about the hydro ecology uh, not being taken. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, in a position. I don't know much about this subject. Are there any other questions? Uh, Mr. Jain, before you leave, can I? Uh, so based on what you're saying, it appears that you know renewables, while they're developing and solar is becoming more popular and the prices are, are falling and wind has matured. Uh, but despite all of these developments, coal will remain the mainstay uh, for India. Is that your sense over the years? Coal will remain the major source of energy for India. Yes. Uh that is correct and uh, um, in, uh, in the in the 12th fiber plan uh, out of the 78000 uh, uh, 78 gigawatt fresh capacity addition which is proposed uh, more than uh, two thirds of it is going to come from coal and uh, in the 13th five year plan 2017 to 22 again uh, where we propose to add something like 80 gigawatt again coal will have a uh, dominance but uh, but my take is that uh, post 2022 uh, the uh, other sources of energy uh, renewable particularly and uh, nuclear and gas based generation and others uh, might uh, start kicking in in, in greater proportions uh, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, we ha we have to take note of the fact that uh, indian uh, coal production will not be able to match uh, the uh, the the uh, the false sense of uh, uh, you know uh, some kind of a satisfaction that we have that we have huge coal reserves uh, is actually uh, mistaken because when you actually come to produce them good quality coal uh, we look at uh, Indian coal production taking a dip in the in the mid 2030s mm -hmm. so uh, we will have to be careful before we commit ourselves to a large coal denominated uh, power strategy. And ending up in uh, yes, please. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You see, about the coal, are there enough coal resources to meet its eight percent growth rate? You know, sustain the kind of requirements with which we are dealing. You see, there was a policy brief prepared by TD addressing precisely this question: Where is coal? And what I was surprised to find, that first of all, they tried to do, you know, argue and point out that the assessment of geological assessment, how far it is unreliable, unreliable. Even if you resolve, because you say now United Nations has developed a formula and approach, how you should make this assessment, the geological, technical, economic. In fact, uh, in that, uh, I think, in that uh, brief, I think, the, with diagram entity that is shown, quite interesting. And possibly increasingly people will, with different countries, will adopt that met method and it will give more reliable estimate. Second is, given my own modeling experience, twice I got this similar result, one third of Indian coal as given by GSI is just not, you cannot touch it, because not mineable coal. Even if what is mineable, now, how far is recoverable? That depends on your technology mix. So there, at most, I think you can go up to 35 to 40 percent, right? Then you come to, you know, at any point of time, given a time horizon of planning, how far I can soon have on the shelf, you know, as projectized. There, the way, the speed in which the coal mining studies uh, go on on the basis of the results of which you pre prepare projects that's also very slow and i found in the working group report of 12 plan on coal and power it is saying that 
whatever would be on the shelf, it can meet 12 plants and only a part of 13 plants requirement. The how things should be sustainable unless reserve accretion data are really enhanced, which is really reliable, the mining studies are, you know, taken up faster and projectizable coal within my time horizon of planning so that my 13th plan demand I can meet without, you know, any risk so far as the percent growth is concerned. Now, these which really worry us. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm Pralab from Rio Tinto Energy Division. So, uh, just want to ask you, uh, what's the future for thorium? A any, when can we expect it? Is there a possibility of thorium to actually really come into nuclear power? Well, thorium, as you know, as per the stated policy of the government, is the third stage. Uh, so, we are yet to reach the second stage and. Uh, we don't look upon thorium as a possible uh, exploitable reserve uh, in the next at least two decades. So, uh, I don't, you will... Uh, in the second stage. That's fast, fast, uh, the, FB, the FBTRs develop. Right. right now, we are at the first stage, so we haven't even... So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Jain. Thank you. I'm, and uh, y since you've answered your question, uh, I mean, you're welcome to sit and, and, and if, if you'd like to leave. Thank you very much for coming. So as I was saying in the introduction, we would be joined by Mr. Mathur in a, in a few minutes. But before that, uh, I would request Mr. Ram, Dr. Ramprasad Sengupta, who you already heard, who's so passionate about energy and has worked so much in this area. So it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Sengupta. Uh, would you make your presentations? And, yeah. You have um, uh, 25 minutes. Uh, uh. Well, thank you, Dr. Kathuria, for giving me again this year the chance to uh, share thoughts with uh, participant conference, annual conference here. Last uh, year also you invited me, but you had indicated that I have to, uh, you know, the focus should be on the, uh, you know, what is, would be India's and developing countries approach to the third industrial revolution. And this year I found your latest said on, on uh, implications of innovations in the alternative energies. Now, I, would, uh, I was just thinking that what has been the difference between over this one year, when I am going on innovation, then I am going on more specifics. Is it that the broad issues which we discussed last year, some of them are sorted out? What I would like to do, what I present, I would contextualize initially, uh, you know, with, uh, with reference to new revolution, new industrial era, which is really required for saving the planet. And uh, that is why I just begin my, I'm sorry that I could circulate the abstract too late. By reading out the first two paras, the process of development since the days of industrial revolution in the 18th century in Western Europe has been mainly based on the development and use of fossil fuels. We had two major waves. One was the coal, and steam power, railway engine, etc. Second wave was hydrocarbon and electricity. Now, um, however, fossil fuel based economic development has given rise to the alarmingly large accumulation of unabsorbed wastes and pollution in the ecosystems of the earth, resulting in not only global climate change but also many other adverse consequences, 
which has got very serious impact on public health. The need for transforming the global economy and society to control climate change and clean up environment up at local and global level has led to the development of the vision of a new industrial area based primarily on the development of <coughs> on the one hand renewables and on the other hand hydrogen and uh, you know fuel cell technology uh, for really uh, making substantive changes in technology and controlling the adverse impact in both electricity production and transportation. These are the two major areas which explain for 80% of our ecosystem pressure on the ecosystem. Since the sources of supply of renewables are mostly, you know, if I exclude hydro storage, that means a large hydro plant, then uh, it is the new renewables that is uh, mainly what, is, what we can get from abiotic sources like air, uh, I mean the wind uh, and solar power and biomass based sources that is, you know, from biomass or waste to straight to energy. Now, what I would focus on, on two, two contexts, I would not really, I do not have the data to discuss about the, uh, the whole range of G20 countries, so I will take India as it is an important case. What we have been able to do, what are our main constraints, what is the potential of getting electricity, I will focus on the electricity sector, not transport sector. And what is the potential, what maximum we can possibly achieve within a reasonable time frame? I will illustrate with some numbers on which I have myself worked and my professional colleagues who have worked. And I will, in this context, draw upon heavily on the work of a team in the World Institute of Sustainable Energy at Pune. And they had been brought out a recently a volume called, uh, I think, the it is time for decide on coal, you know, how far we can rely on coal and what best renew, new renewables can achieve. And what are the challenges involved? Are there in externalities also, in, uh, adverse externalities involved also in the context of uh, these new renewables? How to meet the challenges? So this is really the, the introduction behind this. Now let me just see. Uh, one particular uh, thing what I would like to uh, flag is that people's, as soon as sustainable word is used, people think this is something mainly or only to deal with environment. I think sustainability is something which is, which may be very vital in the context of, in the context of um, uh, uh, both environmental sustainability macroeconomics, dynamic sustainability of the macrodynamics, strengthening of the macro fundamentals, just as strengthening the ecosystem's health, and thirdly also sustainability, social sustainability. The poverty should be removed, social tension has to be reduced. So all these three dimensions of sustainability is there if we really have to discuss development meaningfully and in a comprehensive sense. And that is why a lot of work is going on on what should be the development, development indicator which will, you know, cover uh, all these three aspects of development. Now, I would like to just share with you that there is a problem with macroeconomic sustainability of the development process given our dependence on fossil fuel. Now, as just, you know, the question which was raised, I was telling my impression about the reliability and availability of fossil fuel, like main fos our fossil fuel coal. This shows us uh, that what is the kind of share of import in apparent consumption in 89-90 and just compare with 2010-11. Uh, it has substantively gone up for not only for oil but also for coal and also now 
natural gas, which is the newest fossil fuel, we are now importing, even of about around 8% of our requirement. Now, if this is a trend, then uh, it is a question of uh, how much we have to pay for the import bill. And uh, this is, of course, the overall, you know, in terms of primary energy shares of the different fuels. But what I would like to just emphasize, or show that these are the graphs of the growth of share of net imports of all fossil fuel in oil equivalent terms. It is growing annually at 3.5 percent rate. Now, can we, you know, can we pay for this? Now, this is the. I mean, let me just show the trend of what is going to be the trend of prices. What is happening? Now, if I just take in current dollar per ton, this is the graph. Okay, so it is going up and up. The trend is upward. This is just not oil. I am considered weighted average index we computed for oil, coal, and natural gas. In, what is the share of uh, import bill in our total export earnings? This is the graph. It is now. I, I ended it 2011. I, I understand it has now touched 40% of the deal. Mind it, 40% of entire export earnings just to meet this fossil fuel import bill. Then whatever will remain, you have to meet all other requirements out of that. Now you can still sustain if there is growth of enough of export earnings from our services, say IT services and others. And plus, if I, we can have adequate flow, sustained flow of uh, foreign investment, in whether in uh, FDI form or in, uh, uh, you know, uh, equity investment form. Now, so, the, what are the reasons? One is, as I mentioned, inadequate accretion of reserves caused by slow discovery of our deposits. Not that we have exhausted the exploration opportunity. Inadequate technical progress in the recoverability of reserves and high cost of new source of non-renewable energy. These three have really contributed to this kind of picture. Now, uh, I would not, uh, what are now the options? Now, there is one question about hydro and nuclear. I would not enter into that because time is limited. But about the nuclear issue which was uh, one of the participants raised, I think it will take time. We have the second largest deposit of thorium. But until and unless we have developed the fast breeder reactor cycle, and there uh, we cannot pass on to the third one. Now, fast breeder reactor, again, if you go into the details, I have written, you know, uh, in my book, one in chapter, what is required is enough of, you know, acc accumulation of uh, retrieved, uh, uh, you know, this um, uh, um, fissile material, right, from the first stage, and for which you need essentially a larger base of uranium-based fuel, which we have very little, and that is why our success in engagement in, uh, you know, nuclear trade, and particularly uranium trading, that is very crucial. That will tell you the answer at what speed maximum you can really go ahead along uh, a dimension. Now, about the solar energy potential, I will mainly focus on solar and wind. Now, what is the estimate? How much we, how much we are producing and, uh, you know, uh, I will just show you the current situation about the industry size, the renewable industry. This tells you the total, not the energy unit, but in capacity unit, what is the share of hydro, thermal, nuclear, and renewables which are grid interactive. And what is non-utility? What is the share of total, install, uh, total installed capacity? These are absolute figures. And off-grid capacity of non-renewables. I think Koshik raised this point and grand total. Now you just see, total we have installed capacity, we had installed capacity at the end of 11-12 of 237 gigawatt. Out of that, uh, 
our grid interactive renewable was capacity. This is not energy. 24.49 gigawatt. And our off-grid capacity of renewables was 0 0.9 gigawatt. So this is not really the major source. But I have something to say in, in favor of argument of this low dependence. One is this, uh, and, and you see among the share, what are these, um, uh, these grid interactive uh, you know, te technologies? What is the share of in, in terms of capacity? Mainly wind. Wind is 70%. If you consider off-grid, you don't, you find SPV is very limited, 14 percent. Major thing in off-grid is biomass based, right? Biomass or waste, from waste you produce electricity. So this, this is the one very important distinction we have to keep in mind and there must be some logistical reason and technological reasons why in grid interactive we can depend on wind and on uh, and for uh, off-grid, we, we have to, we mainly depend on whatever biomass we can convert with new technologies. Now, uh, let me come, how much is really the potential? These are capacities as on a particular historical date. Now, how is solar energy potential be calculated? We, 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 we are very, you know, Superficially, we talk about, we, we have so much of sunlight, we can convert it into this. What about the deserts and all that? Now, the point is this, everything, most of the energy resource for its development require land. Solar requires land for the erection of the solar panels. And not only that, how do you convert? So the sunlight is coming in short wave. What is the factor by which that short wave energy I can convert into photovoltaic energy? Power. Now, these are the number. Now, there are two kinds of, uh, you know, waves through which uh, solar light is coming and which we can harness for converting into SPV. One is global horizontal irradiance and the other is direct normal irradiance directly coming and the other is, you know, sunlight is getting diffused. Now, for both of these, our scientists and technologists have found out that per square kilometer, uh, per square meter, per day, on the average irradiance, how much electricity can be produced? Energy can be produced for both the times. And now, how much the land is available? Land and then this productivity value per square meter we have to, there is a reference to land for normalization. Now, how, how, how much land is available? Again here, since if you use the land for, you know, for this erection of these panels, you cannot cultivate. So, what government has decided, the policy is that we would not touch agricultural land, it will be grown in wasteland. And there again, out of wasteland, how what proportion is usable for the for this purpose? It has been assumed as a five percent utilizability. Now, if you do that, right? It is a calculation. Now, you know how soon or when it can be attainable is a different question. We can have a potential of eight hundred and fifty-one gigawatt of SPV. Now, there are two kinds of broadly technology. One of the participants raised this issue. There are different technologies, mainly broadly two types. One is solar photovoltaic technology, and the other is concentrated solar power, which is, you know, through mirrors you uh, concentrate the solar energy, burn, you know, have, uh, you know, fuel, uh, you know, the fi firing and combustion. And, and then they use, use that for raising steam and just uh, rotate your turbine. Now, this is the other, other route. Now, the, if you use it for one purpose, you cannot use it for the other purpose. So, in either way, it is 851 gigawatt and 710 gigawatt. But our planners have also worked out, or, or our scientists have worked out, for different mix of these two technologies, which one would be the best combination. Similarly, for the wind energy, <coughs> for the wind energy, uh, 
the potential depends on, and many of you would be knowing, it is the hub height and at what force speed uh, air is coming. That depends on the height. That is one. And then in different areas of the, of the country, given the availability of this wind flow and its strength, we have different productivity per, uh, you know, per, per again square kilometer. Now on that basis, different organizations have made different estimates, which varies from 45, uh, uh, you know, gigawatt. This is our sea wet estimated. Lawrence Barclay Lab, they estimated and found out to be uh, at 80 meter hub height, 3121 gigawatt. And for uh, the offshore, offshore, there has been similar estimates because <coughs> at, at uh, you know, hub height of 60 meter, and again, such power capacity creation of, uh, over the 2023 horizon uh, is really about near, near about 15 uh, you know, gigawatt. So these are the potential capacities that we can have. And let me also flag a few things which are generally escape our notice. Now, say in Gujarat, this has been experimented. They are trying on the Narmada's canals, on the bank of the canals, have you fix your panels and generate power, SVP. So if we think of, you will, you will follow that strategy in the, all the canals and river banks available, one can generate a lot of power. So solar potential in that sense is quite high, although the <coughs> it will require a lot of developmental efforts. The, are you just, <coughs> what is happening about cost? After all, it is an economic decision. This is March 2012's position about, you know, as I could get from CERC regulation and the Planning Commission source. You see, from for solar, uh, the it is 10 to 12 uh, <coughs> rupees per kilowatt hour, and uh, rupees 10 to 13 crore per megawatt. Others are substantively lower. Uh, wind is almost wind and small hydro going to be almost competitive soon with coal thermal. Now. What is happening? Now it is being repeatedly, we are told that um, cost of price of solar modules coming down. How is it coming down? So this is the full cost, you know, this is KPMG, you know, one report uh, where they drew from other an analyst report and this shows how full cost line and the uh, PV modules price, average price, now how do they compare and they are expected that it, things would be viable um, when uh, uh, the PM full cost, uh, full cost will come down only before, uh, below the uh, tariff, only after 2015-16. So we have to have some patience here. Now, we have, the calculations have also been made about the grid parity, you know. Uh, scale if we upgrade solar power and how that cost would be going up or, or going down the landed cost of power and on the other hand the utility based one is utility based power and the other is LCP grid brand you know what is the price or the cost that is compare solar utility versus landed cost of power at grid so at different voltage levels here what is found, what is, uh, you know, hope matters of, you know, positive expectation.